begin our time this evening in God's Word. Let's take a few moments to uh, go to the Lord in prayer. We'll begin with a few moments of silent prayer to give everyone the opportunity to make sure that you are spiritually prepared to study the Word, ready to focus, ready to concentrate under the ministry of God the Holy Spirit. So we'll have a few moments of silent prayer, and then I will open in prayer. Let's pray. Father, indeed, we are so grateful to you for all that you have given us, that at this time in, our, in history, you have given us a complete salvation. You have given us the Holy Spirit who indwells us, who fills us, and who is indeed the power, uh, the enabler for our spiritual life, the one who enables us to understand your word, and the one who enables us to live the life that you would have us to live, and the one who produces fruit in our life. Father, we pray especially for these men who have uh, served with the seminary on the board, on the faculty, as students. We pray for them in each of their ministries and that uh, they, their ministries would continue to uh, bring glory and honor to you. And now, Father, we pray as we study your word that we might come to a greater understanding of the significance of this for each of our lives and how uh, this impacts the way we think, the way we live, uh, that we may live in a way that reflects the character of Jesus Christ. We pray this in his precious name. Amen. Open your Bibles with me this evening to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. As we have gone through this conference, uh, there is a more of a structure to this conference. You guys come on in and find your seats and Get ready. There's more of a structure to this conference than we've had in the past because of the, on the one hand, the complexity of the theology that we've been going through, and on the other hand, sort of the confusion that exists. And so we started off with a flyover that uh, Paul uh, Schmidt-Bleicher gave us, and then we began to zero in on some of the different uh, models. And by models, we mean that there are certain theological patterns or structures or systems that have been developed down through the ages. And the three that most significantly impact us in our tradition have been the Reformed tradition coming out of a Calvinistic background, the uh, uh, Keswick uh, victorious life position that came out of mostly of a Wesleyan uh, heritage in the 19th century, and then the uh, Chaferian position, which is a view of Dr. Lewis Berry Chafer, who is the founder of Dallas Theological Seminary, and is specifically stated in his book, He That Is Spiritual. Some of you uh, may not have ever read that. I was surprised this week to find a man here who has his doctorate in theology, and is a good friend of mine who's never read He That Is Spiritual. So I commend this to you, that you take the time to read he that is spiritual. <clears throat> so we have gone through a look at each of those models, some of their distinction, distinctive th distinctiveness, the things that separate them, because 90% 90, 90 is probably the same, but it's that other 10% or so that may, really does make a difference in terms of the practical uh, shoe leather sort of approach to Christianity and the way a, a, a Christian should think about the issues and the challenges of life. And then today we began to get into the text a little more. Uh, Charlie went through the Old Testament, uh, the ministry of God, the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament. Uh, and then we got into First um, John this afternoon. That probably lost a lot of people because of the a uh, tremendous amount of detail that's there, and that's one of the difficulties with that book, and I think David just did a fabulous job in uh, trying to condense that down and to present some the core issues there. And then I got several reports ex of George, Dr. Meisinger, providing an excellent analysis of Romans 6. So those provide these core passages, the exegetical detail foundation for our understanding of the spiritual life. And what I'm doing in the evening is trying to tie all of these together, looking at five or six other key passages in the New Testament and pulling it together in terms of a uh, 
good functional model so that people say, well, okay, when all of this is said and done, just how do we live the Christian life? And so that is, that's the focus. So last night I looked at the first passage, which I believe is foundational to understand, and that is John chapter 15, uh, Jesus' discourse on the vine, abiding in Christ. That's part of what is usually referred to as the upper room discourse. It was Jesus teaching to his disciples the night before he went to the cross. And that began in John chapter 13 when they celebrated the Passover together and Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. We'll get into that section uh, tomorrow night. And then in John chapter 14, he talked about the coming of the Holy Spirit, that he would leave, but he would send another comforter. And then following that, he talks about abiding in him in the vine, uh, talks some more in chapter 16 about the coming of the Holy Spirit, the divine comforter. And then there is Jesus' prayer for his disciples and those who would follow in their footsteps in what is called the high priestly prayer in John chapter 17. That discourse is taken as a whole, and that provides the foundation for what is then expanded on in the epistles, the epistles of Paul, uh, notably in the first epistle of John and the epistles of Peter in relationship to uh, the spiritual life of the believer. Now, there's three things that I emphasized at the conclusion of the message last night that we learned from John chapter uh, 15. The first is, that this phrase abiding, when Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, he who abides in me will bear much fruit. This concept of abiding is a relational term. It talks about the fact that the branch is in a close relationship uh, to the uh, vine and draws its sustenance from the vine. It is dependent upon the vine. It is a tremendous picture of dependence and where the, and as the branch draws its source of strength from the vine. And I pointed out that abiding therefore describes this ongoing fellowship with Jesus Christ. Now tonight we need to address this question a little more than I did last night. What exactly is fellowship? Fellowship is found also in 1 John. David mentioned this today in three passage, passages in the opening chapter of 1 John. John uses the noun for fellowship. It's the Greek word koinonia. He says in verse 3, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you, that you also may have fellowship with us. Now the you is the congregation, the recipients of the letter, the us is, refers to John and the apostles because he says, our, tru, and truly our fellowship, that is the fellowship of the apostles, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. That is a vertical fellowship that, and that is the focal point of what we're discussing in terms of our spiritual life, our relationship to Jesus Christ, to God the Father and the Holy Spirit. In verse 6, John goes on to say, if we say, if we claim, that's the idea there, uh, it's a third class condition, maybe we do, maybe we don't, but we might say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness. Again, we have this metaphor of walking, which describes a lifestyle. We walk in darkness. We lie and we do not practice the truth. And then in verse 7 we read, But if, contrast, if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. And so here we have a focus on a fellowship. Fellowship for John, the word fellowship, is uh, equivalent or related to, it's not identical to, it's not a synonym for, but it is equivalent to the word f- to abide. The word for fellowship is the Greek word koinonia. It refers to an association, a communion, a fellowship, or a participation. The emphasis is on a close union and bond, and it is based on two or more people having something in common. So we can say that um, 
that in 1 John 1, John bases the fellowship that he is talking about on three things. First of all, fellowship is based there on a correct view of the undiminished deity and the true humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is seen in the first four verses. And there he emphasizes the fact that if you have a wrong view of Jesus, then you are out of fellowship. It's not Fellowship is not broken just because you have committed sin. Fellowship with God cannot be maintained if you have uh, heretical doctrine. And just because you talk about Jesus and just because you say that you love Jesus and just because you repeat the name Jesus many times doesn't mean you're talking about the biblical Jesus. The only way to know Jesus is to study the Bible, to study the New Testament. I mean, just because you have a label, J-E-S-U-S, on somebody, I mean, it could be Jesus the gardener. Uh, The only thing that makes the difference is identification of character and understanding uh, who that is. And so the Jesus of Nazareth that we worship is the one who is eternally in his deity, eternally God, and in his humanity he was without sin. He entered into human history at the Incarnation, and he uh, died on the cross as a substitute for our sins, went to the grave, and rose on the third day. Second, we learn that fellowship with God and walking in darkness are mutually exclusive. You're either walking in the light or you're walking in darkness. You're not walking with one foot in darkness and one foot in the light. It is very common in many sectors of Christianity to talk about the fact that, well, you know, we never do anything from a really pure motive. And that sounds good because that's true. But when we don't have a pure motive, we are walking in darkness. We're not walking in the light. And so there is the view of many. This is within the Reformed position. Uh, Typically, you will find this, that you don't need to uh, uh, confess your sin because it will automatically be, be cleansed and taken care of. You just need to do what the Scripture says to do, and God the Holy Spirit somehow will use that for your uh, spiritual growth. Third, we learn from this passage that fellowship is synonymous or equivalent to walking in the light. Walking in the light. Now, I said earlier that fellowship is equivalent to abiding and to walking in the light. Now, abiding is a verb, it's action. Walking is a verb and it's action. And when we normally talk about these things, sometimes our language is not always the most precise, but fellowship really describes a state, and walking and abiding describe the way we stay in that particular state. So let's go back and let me point out a couple of things about abiding. First of all, fellowship is based, as we see here, fellowship was based on Uh, as I said, related to fellowship. Fellowship is based on a correct view of the undiminished deity and true humanity of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in John, we saw that abiding is based on believing the message about Christ that they heard from the beginning. That's seen in 1 John 2, 24. So you see that abiding and fellowship are both related to having an accurate understanding of the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. Second, we saw that fellowship with God and walking in darkness were mutually exclusive. Abiding is walking in the same manner as Jesus walked, 1 John 2, 6, and so that is also walking in the light. So again, we see that fellowship and abiding are equivalent and related terms. Third, we saw that fellowship was walking in the light in the first part of 1 John in verse John 1, 7, and in 1 John 2, 10, abiding is walking in the light. So this is what I was talking about earlier today when it's important to take a word that John uses earlier, and then later on he'll use another word, but he'll say the same thing about that word that he said about the previous word. So that means that if A equals C, follow me here, and B equals C, then A and B must be closely related to one another because they both equal C. So we can say that abiding in Christ is equivalent to fellowship. Now the word fellowship coming out of 
Webster's Dictionary. Just want to highlight a couple of things. Uh, emphasizes this community, uh, the second meaning, uh, community of interest, activity, or experience, or, or a, secondly, a state of being, or, uh, being a fellow or associate. You see this word state mentioned again in the fourth meaning, the quality or state of being comra- uh, comra- comradely. Now, this is important to understand that in English, that suffix, that S-H-I-P suffix, indicates that the noun uh, is a noun of a state or a quality. So we often speak about being in fellowship or out of fellowship, and what we mean by that is being in this state or not being in this state. In some sense, fellowship is similar to marriage. At the point at which you got married, it was a legal action. It's really a function of the state, not the church. And what really, most people don't realize this when I do a wedding, what actually makes them married is not even when I sign the marriage license, it's when I mail it off to the county clerk. That's when it really becomes official. Up to that point, uh, it can be uh, annulled pretty easily. So you have a marriage. It is a legal fellowship at that point. It is not experiential. Now, after the wedding ceremony is over with and the husband and the bride go off on their honeymoon, then it begins to be experiential. And as they begin to spend time together, as they live together, or as the Scripture uses the term, walk together, then that relationship deepens until suddenly the husband does something and he's in the doghouse. (laughs) And then... He's not enjoying that fellowship with his wife, that state of marriage. Uh, The joy of that has been lost. And then when he comes and he apologizes, then he's let back in out of the doghouse. And he's able to enjoy the state of marriage again. The state of marriage and its joy is maintained by... Walking in obedience. It works both ways. <laughs> Husbands are more used to this, so I thought that I would point it out for them. So, so fellowship is that state that exists, but that state of rapport with God has to be maintained through following certain protocols. And when those protocols are violated, then that state of fellowship is broken. So we see that this is similar to the idea of both minnow and koinonia. Koinonia, I would say that minnow, the concept of abiding, is a richer, deeper idea, and one maintains the state of fellowship by abiding in Christ. and, uh, And by abiding in Christ, then that relationship deepens and matures and becomes richer over time. So... We can say that abiding and walking are actions which maintain the experiential state of partnership or rapport between the believer and God. Now, the second thing that came out of our study of John 15 last night was that there are three kinds of Christians that are represented by those three kinds of branches that are connected to the vine. The first represented the young believer, the young branch that was not yet producing fruit. And so the vine dresser God lifts it up so that it can receive more sunshine, more air. And in the next season, as it's grown a little stronger, then it will begin to bear fruit. The second type of branch was the maturing branch that produces fruit, much fruit, and more fruit. Then we had the third branch, which was the non-fructifying branch, And because it did not bear fruit, it would come under divine discipline. And eventually, if it did not bear fruit, if that branch of that believer does not abide in Christ so that it becomes useful, then it may be removed under some form of more severe divine uh, discipline. Third, I pointed out that in John 15, there's only two options. You either abide or you abide not. There is not a partial abiding and partially not. It is one or the other. They are mutually exclusive. And so we might chart it this way with these two 
uh, spheres. It's either one or the other. The spheres do not overlap. You're either abiding in him or you are not abiding in him. And so in terms of charting this a little bit, we have the command from Jesus, abide in me. And that is presented as the sole and necessary condition for bearing fruit, for being productive in our spiritual life and our relationship with God. The result of abiding in him is that we bear fruit, more fruit, and much fruit. The sole and necessary condition here is stated to be abide in me. So that's one image that the scripture uses to convey this idea of drawing our, our nurture, our nourishment from the Lord Jesus Christ. This would be from his uh, thinking. We have uh, 1 Corinthians 2.16, we have the mind of Christ. It is through the word of God, the spirit of God, that we are nourished in our spiritual life. Now, we're going to move tonight to another passage in Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, we have a command in Galatians chapter 5, verse 16, that we are to walk by means of the Spirit. The result of that is that the fruit of the Spirit is produced in our life. The sole and necessary condition expressed in Galatians chapter 5 is walk by means of the Spirit. The result the fruit of the Spirit. So if action A, abide in Christ, produces result C, and action B, walking by means of the Spirit, produces the same result, C, which is the bearing of fruit, then we can say that A and B must be very closely related. They're talking about virtually the same thing under a slightly different image in order to emphasize something. The idea of abiding emphasizes dependence. The idea of walking by the Holy Spirit also emphasizes dependence. And what is being communicated is that the spiritual life, the Christian life, is a life that is dependent totally and exclusively upon God. It is a supernaturally empowered life that cannot be produced on our own. Man on his own power cannot produce that which God alone can produce in our life, which is spiritual growth and spiritual maturity. So we have seen that abiding means to maintain fellowship with Christ. A believer either abides or not. Therefore, conclusion in this syllogism, at any point in time, a believer either has and maintains fellowship with Christ or not. There's no middle ground. Conclusion, fellowship is an absolute status. Therefore, that's what we mean when we say we believe in absolute spirituality. You either are or you are not in right relationship uh, to the Holy Spirit, which is walking by the Spirit. Believers cannot be partly in fellowship and partly out of fellowship. Now let's look at what the Scripture says here. This is one of my favorite passages to teach favorite sections of Scripture to go over because Paul has such a wonderful way of constructing his instruction and his argument here in uh, the epistle to the Galatians. The Galatians had a problem. The basic problem was that after Paul had uh, come to that part, the southern area of, uh, of Galatia, and gone to Lystra and Iconium and Derbe and presented the gospel, after he left, there were groups of Jews who opposed what he was preaching, especially the inclusiveness of Gentiles, into uh, this, this new work. And so they came along behind and said, you know, it's really great that you believe Jesus is the Messiah. That's just really wonderful. But you're really not going to get the full experience of a relationship with God and a full, the full blessing of God unless you also follow the Mosaic law, unless you are also, the men are also circumcised. And it is only by believing in Jesus as the Messiah that's great, but you have to also follow the law. So it was a faith in Christ system plus human works and human effort. And in the first part of this, this epistle, Paul is going to uh, correct their view of the gospel. And then in the second part of the epistle, he has to correct their view of the uh, spiritual life. 
And he doesn't really get down to the core issue until he gets into this verse in Galatians 5.16 where he says, Walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now there are three key terms in this verse which I've underlined on the screen. The first is Spirit, the second is fulfill, and the third is flesh. And I'll show you in just a second why those three terms are so important. In the first two chapters, Paul dealt with the issue related to salvation or justification. Salvation, that is, how do you enter into uh, eternal life? How are your sins paid for? How do you experience eternal forgiveness from God? And that comes only by trusting in Jesus and Him alone for salvation. This is referred to as justification by faith. How can a man be just before God? No matter how many sins you and I may have committed, how can we stand before, a, before God and be declared just? That is the burning question throughout the centuries, going back to Job, which is probably the very first uh, book ever written in the Bible. How can a man be just before God? We can't. When we examine our thoughts, when we examine our motives, when we examine our actions, we realize that even the best of us have soiled works. Isaiah put it this way, said, all our works of righteousness are as filthy rags. Not our unrighteousness is filthy. He said our righteousness is filthy. So therefore, the only way that we can be just before God is if somehow God cleanses us from that unrighteousness. God gives us perfect righteousness, and that is done when we trust in Jesus for our salvation. We are re we're given the righteousness of Christ, and God looks at his righteousness, not our righteousness, and declares us to be just. So Paul puts it this way in Galatians 2.16. He says, because we know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified. So this brings to a conclusion in the next two or three verses his discussion on the essence of the gospel in those first two chapters. But then he's going to move beyond that in the next chapter to the second division and begin to address the spiritual life, addressing the legalism of the spiritual life. Not only were the Judaizers saying you needed to uh, believe in Jesus and obey the law in order to get salvation, in order to experience the blessing of God in your life, you also had to follow uh, follow the law, men had to be circumcised, etc. So Paul says at the beginning of his shift to sanctification in verse 2, he says, this only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit, that is, when you were saved and God the Holy Spirit indwelt you, did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? See, the emphasis here is going to be on faith, the importance of that the Christian life is based on, an ent is entered into by faith in Christ alone, and, it, it, and its continuation in terms of growth is based on a walk by faith. This is seen in other passages such as 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith and not by sight, and Colossians 2, 6, as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Paul is consistent. Our entry into the spiritual life, our reception actually of the spiritual life, our regeneration is by faith alone in Christ alone. And after we're saved, the way we grow and mature is a walk by faith. That doesn't mean that it excludes things. Faith means we trust God so that when God says we are to do X or not to do Y, then our uh, obedience to those precepts is based on trusting him. That's what it means to walk by faith. We are to walk in him by faith, not by works. So in the next verse, in Galatians 3.3, 3, Paul really reams them out. He says, are you so foolish that having begun in the spirit, you are now being made perfect 
by the flesh. See, those are those three words I underlined in Galatians 5.16. Now just think about how much distance there is between Galatians 3.3 3 and Galatians 5.16. He takes all that time to answer this question. He has to set it up. Sometimes some of us are accused of being a little long-winded, that you take a long time setting up your introduction. You take a long time working through three or four or eight or ten points before you really drive it home. You would not have liked the Apostle Paul if you think that way. The Apostle Paul took the rest of chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter and half of chapter 5 before he could come back and address this question because he needed to make sure that his audience understood why he could say what he is saying starting in Galatians 5.16. He needed to answer their objections and questions up front before he could get to the real practical application and drive the point home in Galatians 5.16. So what we see here is a comparison now between Galatians 3.3 and Galatians 5.16. See these same words emphasize spirit in both places. In the in 3.3, 3, the word that is used and translated perfect is epiteleo, and the root verb teleo is what is used for fulfill in Galatians 5.16. And then uh, the word flesh, sarx, for the sin nature, is found in both of those passages. The emphasis here is on dependent, stressing the need for the believer to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit, just as... We were dependent upon God exclusively and totally for salvation. When we were saved, we recognized there's nothing that we could do. There's not one thing we could do to to impress God to gain his favor. We had to trust exclusively on Jesus. That because of that, we were then saved. Faith alone, nothing else. Faith alone in Christ alone. And then Paul says, since we began by faith alone in Christ alone, we continue by faith. And that is expressed by this phraseology, the walk in the Spirit. Now, Longnecker says about this passage that the main point of Paul's rhetorical question here, that is in Galatians 3.3, however, has to do with the incongruity of beginning one's Christian life on one basis, that is with the Spirit, and then shifting somewhere in progress to another basis, that is, human effort. What Paul wants his converts to see is that the Christian life is one that starts, is maintained, and comes to culmination only through dependence on the activity of God's Spirit. He references Galatians 5.25, Philippians 1.6, where the same verbs in archomai, and epitoleo appear, and where the point is made, the completion of the Christian life comes about on the same basis as its inception, that is, by dependence upon, uh, upon God. What we see in Paul is this constant uh, juxtaposition of key terms, law versus grace. The law is holy, Paul said in Romans 7, as we'll hear from uh, Dr. Wood tomorrow. It's holy and good. There's nothing wrong with it, but it isn't going to bring us righteousness. That's the great theme of Romans, the gift of righteousness by God. That comes only by grace. We also have the juxtaposition of works and faith. Works is man trying to gain God's approval by doing something that brings him merit by somehow gaining points with God through ritual, uh, through morality. Now remember, just a point here, that the Galatians were very moral. This is one of the great points of confusion for many Christians, and especially if you come out of a Reformed model where there's no emphasis on the, on the Spirit, the emphasis is just do the right thing. Doing the right thing is equivalent to the work of the Holy Spirit. But that's just plain old morality. I mean, there are a lot of unbelievers I know who have much greater integrity and much more consistent morality than many Christians I know. That's, that's just a real shame. 
But I, I see that, and you've seen that as well. Morality doesn't get you anywhere, though, is what Paul is saying. And the Galatians who were trying to be matured and grow uh, by the works of the law were being very moral. They had believed in Jesus, and now they were implementing the Mosaic law, and they were extremely moral. They had an external righteousness. But Paul is saying that's not getting you anywhere because any human being can produce a certain measure of external righteousness or external uh, good, but it is not equivalent to the righteousness that God alone can produce. And therefore, when your emphasis is on the law and works, the result is that we, you are enslaved to this religious system. And the religious systems of the world are filled with this kind of enslavement in order to somehow impress God with our repentance, with our change of mind that somehow we didn't really mean it. And again and again you hear people say that, that well, I suspect that when, when I come to God that he will ask me on what basis I get into heaven. I'll say, well, look at all these good things that I did. And yet if we think about this just a little bit, we realize that 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 really doesn't work in any area of life. I often use this as an illustration that uh, when people drive around a lot, and maybe you went 60 or 70 years without a traffic ticket. Maybe you never ran a stop sign or ran a red light. I can't relate to people like that, but maybe you're that kind of person. Maybe you, you were never speeding down the freeway, never got a ticket. And then one day, you don't see it, you run a stop sign, and you are involved in a collision, and there's bodily damage done to, to some victim. And so you go before the, the judge, and the judge asks you if you did it, and you say, yes, judge, but you know, I've got a 70-year track record here where I never broke a traffic law. Can't we just balance out this one mistake with all those times that I stopped at the stop sign, I stopped at the red light, I never hurt anybody, I never had a collision, and the judge is just going to look at you like you lost your mind. And that's the way God's going to be. No judicial system balances the good with the bad. If you break the law, then you are going to be uh, punished. And so there is an enslavement then that comes with this rigid emphasis on legalism and works. And the fourth category that Paul contrasts here is flesh versus spirit. The flesh can produce a counterfeit righteousness. The flesh, in obedience to legal principles, in, in, in obedience to religious principles, can produce a measure of righteousness, but it's counterfeit. It's not produced by God the Holy Spirit. And so this is where he, he drives in his argument in, uh, in Galatians, because at the beginning of Galatians 5, he says it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. You don't have to worry about all of the uh, 613 commandments in the Torah. You don't have to uh, be concerned about the thousands of other traditions that were built up in, in order to protect uh, those 613 commandments from being broken. You don't have to learn all of those uh, laws related to uh, dietary laws and, and, and having different dishes for milk and for meat and all of these other things that are involved because Christ has set us free. So works can't get you salvation, justification, salvation, and works can't get you, move you forward in your spiritual growth. Go back to a couple of basic principles we should be reminded of. Uh, first of all, everything the unbeliever does derives from his position in bondage to the sin nature and proceeds from the sin nature. I'm sure George covered that today uh, when he was uh, covering Romans chapter 6. The unbeliever has no option but to sin. Sometimes this also produces good works, but it is uh, not a good work that measures up to the standard of God. Uh, I've come up with a new uh, addendum to my definition of sin, that sin isn't just simply doing something that violates the character and the standard of God, but sin occurs whenever the creature acts independently of the Creator. 
Now that changes your perspective a little bit because it involves not only the things we normally think of as sin in terms of those things listed in Scripture as sin, those things that are uh, immoral and unrighteous, but it also includes acts of morality that are uh, not produce independence of God. They're an independent, so that doesn't measure up either. So everything comes out of that fallen nature. Secondly, we realize that the unbeliever can live a moral, ethical life. They, by following the Mosaic law or some other system, they can live a moral and ethical life. Therefore, we recognize that simple human morality may be the product of the sin nature. And that's what Paul will get to when he says that the uh, works of the flesh produce this list of sins that he lists there. You can be pursuing morality, as Paul says in Romans 7, trying to do the law, and yet you're doing the things you don't want to do, and you're not doing the things you do want to do. Because apart from the Holy Spirit, you just can't achieve what you know the Scripture says you should have. And therefore, we conclude that only a supernatural source can produce the virtues and the Christ-like character unique to the Christian life. Now, when Paul comes to this last part, this application section of Galatians, he actually begins this in verse 14, where he says, For all of the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is a quote from Leviticus uh, chapter 18. Now, notice the standard that the standard is you shall love your neighbor like yourself. The command is to love your neighbor. Your, na- your neighbor may be, uh, may be a believer, may be an unbeliever, but your, your neighbor in Israel is going to be another member of the covenant family. Uh, your neighbor is not necessarily the Moabites or the Persians or the Egyptians. Uh, it's within that covenant community. But you're to love your neighbor as yourself. You're, that's the standard. Just like you love yourself. Even an unbeliever can love himself. All unbelievers do love themselves. Everybody loves themselves. Paul says that in Ephesians 5, that everyone loves himself. No man hates his own flesh. The whole idea of having poor self-image is bad terminology because everybody has a good self-image because they all love themselves. They disappoint themselves. They may be down on themselves for a little bit, And so because they have a good self-image, they're disappointed in themselves. But the whole self-image thing is just uh, psychobabble. Jesus kind of changed the mandate, though, in John 13, 34, and 35. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Ah, this is a different object. It's not loving your neighbor. It's loving one another, other believers. Now, we all know other believers we don't want to love too much, but... But that's not what Jesus said. It's we can't do it in the power of our own flesh and our own ability. It can only be produced by the Holy Spirit. We can't do this on our own. We're to love one another, Jesus says. And what's the standard? As you love yourself? No. As I have loved you. That's a seriously advanced standard. Jesus isn't using the standard of your own natural self-love. He's using the standard of what he's about to do on the cross. Love one another even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is a significantly different kind of love and a love that can only come as a result of dependence upon the Holy Spirit. So Paul's going to emphasize this by four different phrases in Galatians 5, 16 to 26. First of all, the phrase, walk by the Spirit, uh, using the verb peripeteo in Galatians 5, 16, emphasizing that it's a step-by-step procedure. Secondly, he's going to say that we are led by the Spirit in Galatians 5, 18. Being led by someone, it's, it's somewhat passive. That means someone's out in front and you're following them. I saw a t-shirt the other day coming out of Costco where written on the back of the t-shirt was this saying that, that, that if you're not leading, then the scenery never changes. <laughs> That's got a lot of implications to it, but, 
But if you're following the Holy Spirit, the scenery is never going to change because your focus is on the Holy Spirit. The idea there is the Holy Spirit lays out a path in front of you. It's a clear, set path. This isn't the leading of the Spirit in terms of divine guidance that uh, where you sit around and you pray and you wait for a little liver quiver waiting for God to somehow tell you what to do. This is the fact that the Holy Spirit's laid out a strict path the things you're commanded to do in the Scripture, the things you're prohibited from doing in the Scripture, and you're to follow that leadership. The Holy Spirit is the member of the Godhead responsible for giving objective revelation. So we are to follow His leadership, which is in the Word of God. Third, we're to live by the Spirit in this passage. And last, fourth, we are to walk by the Spirit. This is a different verb than the one earlier. This is stoikeho, which has the idea of following a path, following or staying in step with the Spirit. It sort of pulls these things together in this one particular, uh, one particular image. So we saw the question raised back in Galatians 3.3, 3, are you so foolish having begun in the Spirit? Are you now being made perfect or complete, being brought to maturity by the flesh? The answer, of course, is no, that can't happen. So how do you avoid this? Now we're getting to it in Galatians 5.16. Paul says, I say, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now both David Roseman this morning and David Dunn this afternoon emphasize that what this verse is really saying is that we're to walk by means of the Spirit. And the idea in the verb here, it's a second person plural, meaning y'all. He's addressing not just the corporate congregation, he's addressing every individual within the congregation, that all of them are to walk by means of the Spirit. It's a present imperative emphasizing that this is to be a habit pattern. This is the uh, normative uh, procedure in the Christian life, the standard operating procedure for every uh, single Christian. Walking involves several things. First, it involves a step-by-step procedure. You can't take your fourth step before you take your first, second, and third step. The focus is on each step at a time, and that produces a series of steps. It involves step-by-step concentration. A number of years ago, I was uh, teaching a spiritual life conference at a church in Poughkeepsie, New York in a black church there, and I stayed in a hotel downtown that was an older hotel. It was a nice hotel. It was probably one of the nicer hotels in the old part of town. And uh, I got ready to go down, take the elevator downstairs to go to um, uh, meet the guy who was coming to pick me up to take me to the church. And I was running just a little bit late. You know how that is. You run just a little bit late. You're in a little bit of a hurry. And I, I got, I'm standing there at the door of the elevator just ready for it to pop open so I can shoot out to get around the corner. And I had to immediately stop because there was a geriatric convention. <laughs> and all of these probably 60 or 70, 80-plus-year-olds their, with their walkers were walking past me. And there was no place to go. I mean, I... I'm 6'2", over 200 pounds. I'm not going to bowl my way through them. I had to stop and watch. God had given me an illustration. They've got their little walkers. And they're putting those little walkers out in front of them and walking down and they're moving along. But if any of them missed, they'd fall down. They were completely dependent upon those walkers. They were walking by means of their walkers. It took concentration. If any of y'all have ever broken your leg or an ankle or anything like that and had to put on a cast, you know what I'm talking about. You have to, at the beginning, you really have to think about each step and concentrate on it. If you've ever had more serious injuries and you've had to learn to walk again, you know it's even more difficult. And that's the idea here. It's we have to think about each step, each move, each decision, each thing we do in life is a act of dependence on God the Holy Spirit. And we're thinking about it. It's like that those little old folks on their walkers, they're leaning on their weights there. If I had reached out with my foot and kicked one, they'd have gone crashing down. Picture that. <laughs> That's what you do every time you stop depending on the Holy Spirit. The automatic result is you fall down and then you begin to sin. 
you fulfill the lust of the flesh. What Paul is saying here is a a, a very important how-to. We are to think, concentrate, focus, conscientiously, moment by moment, live in dependence upon the God, God, the Holy Spirit. Now, not in this mystical, heebie-jeebie, kind of juju black magic way that Mark's going to talk about tomorrow. You depend on the Holy Spirit because He's given us the objective Word. And so we have to learn from that, and we depend on that, and we claim those promises. And those uh, give us those specific how-tos. And then we learn from this that, that when you're walking, it's directed somewhere. There, you're going somewhere. There's a goal, and that goal is to glorify God. That goal is for you to reach spiritual maturity, and that that's your focal point. Now, we walk, as the text says here, in the Spirit. But that's a poor translation. It's a dative in the, in the Greek, but it should be translated by means of the Spirit. This is the Greek preposition in plus a dative, usually emphasizes uh, dependence. Uh, walk by means of the Spirit. He's, he's the walker. You're, you're walking in dependence, leaning upon Him by means of Him. Without Him, you just fall down. Go back to that default position of the sin nature. But Paul follows this command up. He says, walk by means of the Spirit. And then he says, ume. This is a double negative. In English, a double negative equals a positive. But in Greek, if you use a double negative, it just reinforces it. And these are the two different uh, words for no in Greek. And when you follow that up with a subjunctive mood verb, which you have here, it means that this is something impossible to do. If you're walking in dependence on the Holy Spirit you cannot sin. That's like what 1 John is really saying when he says that that the one who is born again doesn't sin because he's saying that the one who lives on the basis of his new nature as a new creature in Christ won't sin. The person who's walking by means of the Spirit won't sin. But as soon as you throw away the walker, you're going to fall into that default position and you're going to sin. One of my favorite professors at Dallas was Stan Toussaint. Still love to see Stan every year at the pre-trib conference. And Stan wrote, in Galatians 5.16, Paul commands the believer to walk by means of the Spirit. This imperative is followed by ume with a subjunctive, which is an emphatic negation used here as a strong promise. The flesh and spirit are so contrary to one another that a walk by the Spirit automatically excludes a fulfillment of the baser desires. See, walking by the Spirit, walking according to the flesh are mutually exclusive. Haven't we heard something like that already? Stan went on to say, in this entire epistle, two alternatives are set before Paul's Christian readers. Either they may walk under law or under grace. These same two choices are open in Galatians 5, 16 to 23. A walk under law necessitates a walk by means of the flesh. At the same time, a life lived in the grace system automatically involves faith and the Holy Spirit. Notice he didn't say faith in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is never stated in Scripture to be the object of faith. It's the Word of God that's the object of faith. And because we're trusting in the Word of God, we're depending upon the Holy Spirit as the one to empower us in our walk. So it involves faith and the Holy Spirit. It's for this reason that the contrast here is between the flesh and the Spirit. They're the two driving forces in each of the two systems of law and grace. So what Paul is saying here is walk by means of the Spirit, and it will be impossible to bring to completion the lust of the flesh. So what we learned from this, what we've learned earlier tying our passages together, is that first of all, a believer either abides or not. He either walks by the Spirit or according to the flesh. These are parallel. Second, we learned that both walking by means of the Spirit and abiding in Christ emphasized divine dependency as the sole basis for producing fruit. Third, we learn that both walking by means of the Spirit and abiding in Christ express an intimacy and the means of maintaining fellowship with the divine person which is not present when the believer is not abiding 
or walking. When we're, de- uh, we're either abiding in Christ or we're walking by the Spirit, we're indwelt by the Trinity, we're depending upon God or we're not, that's it. So our conclusion is that abiding in Christ and walking by the Spirit express overlapping and parallel concepts that are facets of the same dependency, which is the key to spiritual growth. Now we're going to take that and apply it over to 1 John. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through 1 John like David did today. We'll be home before long. 1 John 1, 6, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. On the other hand, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, that state. We have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We'll talk about that last part tomorrow night. What we see here is that in the light is not something that is means, as we see in other, uh, the other passage, walking by means of the Spirit, but it's locative. It's in the sphere of light. Light is used to, to communicate both the pure righteousness of God as well as the revelation of God. Remember in the Old Testament, uh, the psalmist said, in thy light we see light, and we, we walk by the light. It's the light of God's word that illuminates our path. So walking in the light has to do with walking in the light of God's word. It is the word of God that exposes for us uh, sin in our life and as well. In Ephesians chapter 5, Paul uses this same sort of phraseology. He says, you once were dark, you were once darkness, but now you are light of the Lord. That's positional. And then he says, walk as children of light. So on the one hand, your position is that you were made positionally in Christ. You are in the light. But some of you aren't walking like it. Sometimes we walk in darkness. Walking in darkness and walking in the light had to do with our experience, our being light in the Lord has to do with our new position in Christ and our new nature. So in these chapters, we get an emphasis on walking. This is a major emphasis in the last half of Ephesians. In Ephesians 2.10, we have the first mention of walking after Paul's great statement that we are saved by uh, grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. That doesn't mean that works don't play some role. They do in dependence on the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 10, We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for the purpose of good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Then in Ephesians 4, 1, he says, We are to walk worthy of the calling with which we have been called. In Ephesians 4, 17, he says, We should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk, in the futility of their minds. In Ephesians 5, 2, he says, walk in love as Christ also has loved us. Ephesians 5, 8, he says, you were once darkness, but now light. Walk as children of light. And then in Ephesians 5, 15, he says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Notice all through these walk commands, it's either this way or that way. It's not a little bit of both. It's either abide or abide not. It's either walk or by the Spirit, or walk in the flesh. There's this contrast. You've got two opposites. It's one or the other. And all the way down through uh, Ephesians 5, you have this same kind of contrast between two different states. So the command that we've seen in John 15 is, Abide in me, the result is fruit. In Galatians 5, walk by means of the Spirit, the result is fruit. In 1 John and in Ephesians 5, we have walk in the light, walk as children of light. The result is fruit. The means is walking in these different ways, all manifesting the same thing. Dr. Chafer wrote, by various terms, the Bible teaches that there are two classes of Christians, those who abide in Christ and those who abide not, those who are walking in the light and those who walk in darkness, those who walk by the Spirit and those who walk as men, those who walk in newness of life, and those who walk after the flesh, those who have the Spirit in and upon them, and those who have the Spirit in them, but not upon them, those who are spiritual, and those who are carnal, those who are filled with the Spirit, and those who are not, 
All this has to do with the quality of daily life of saved people and is in no way a contrast between the saved and the unsaved. Now, here's a familiar diagram. We come to salvation by trusting in Christ, Acts 6.31. Two simultaneous things happen. On the one hand, there are some eternal realities. These are legal actions, decisions that come from the Supreme Court of Heaven. And then there are our temporal realities. Under eternal realities, we are placed in Christ by the baptism by means of God the Holy Spirit. We are also indwelt by God the Holy Spirit, and church-age believers become the temple of the Holy Spirit in this age. We are children of light. We are light in the Lord. That's that white circle. But then we have an experiential factor. We can either walk in the light or we can walk in darkness. Walking in that light, that circle, staying there is by walking by the Spirit, walking in the light, and walking in the truth. It's equivalent to abiding in Christ. Now, when you look at Ephesians 5, I want to just run through this very rapidly. We're told the believer may imitate God or not, walk by means of love or not in 5.2, have improper conduct or not in 5.3 and 4, be disobedient or not in 5.6, and fifth, walk as children of light or as approving deeds of darkness in verse in 5, 7 through 13. And finally, then Paul shifts the metaphor uh, of light from light is divine perfection to light is the revelation of that perfection that exposes sin in 5, 13 through 14. This sets up the passage we all uh, know. Do not be drunk with wine, which is a dative of means in which is dissipation, but be filled with the spirit. Now, that looks to a lot of people when they read that initially, that filled with the Spirit means that you're getting more of the Spirit. If a lot of people have taught it that way. They'll use, Chafer did. He needed to be corrected at this point. He used the word control because he misunderstood the metaphor at the beginning. So often you'll hear so many people talk about, well, wine, you drink too much wine, it controls you. Control is a term that means it takes over and wipes out your volition. Nothing wipes out our volition. Nothing neutralizes our volition. Uh, a little study in the background of this, Cleon Rogers wrote a great article in Bibsack back in the uh, late 70s on the Dionysian background to Ephesians 5.18. In the Dionysian religion, remember Dionysius was the god of wine, Bacchus the god of wine, the way that you had close fellowship with God and the god entered into your life was that you drank a lot of wine, you went up into the groves and the hills, and you danced, and you got into a religious frenzy, and the God would enter you and fill you, and you would be spiritual. Paul's saying that's a, that's a false methodology. You don't achieve spirituality by means of wine. You achieve spirituality by means of the Holy Spirit. You are filled by means of of the Holy Spirit. It's instrumental. It's like if I say, um, uh, I have a cup and I hand it to you and I say, fill it with, by, with that pot. That pot has water. Another pot has coffee. Another pot has tea. I want you to fill it with that pot. That's the means. If I say, I want you to fill it with coffee, then I'm talking about content. In Greek, content is expressed with a genitive. It's not a genitive here. You have genitive with other forms of this uh, word filled, and that describes character and it describes other aspects of a person's life. But this is the only time we have this kind of a command followed with a dative, and it is a command that you either obey or you don't obey, but when you ob obey it, you are filled with something by the Holy Spirit. You're not filled with more of the Holy Spirit. You can't get any more of him. He's going to, but he's going to fill you with something. Now, what are the results of it? Ephesians 5.19, for those of you who don't like to sing, you're going to have to quit being carnal and start being spiritual. One of the evidences of the filling of the Spirit is speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then it continues. So the command is to be filled 
by means of the Spirit with something. We're not told with what. The emphasis here is on the means. The result is spiritual songs, hymns, thanksgiving, and then he goes on to talk about husbands loving your wives, wives submitting to your husbands, uh, fathers not exasperating your children to wrath, children obeying your parents, etc. We have a parallel passage in Colossians. Colossians, the command is to let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. You think that's content or means? It's content. What are the results? teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord, and whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So on the one hand, you're told to be filled by means of something, and it's going to produce this. In another place, you're told to have something fill your life, content, and it produces the same thing. So if A produces C and B produces C, then A and B fit together. So it is God the Holy Spirit who fills us with his word so that as we are walking by the Spirit, abiding in Christ, then the Spirit fills us with his word and it results then in, in, in our application of his word in the, all of the areas of life. Come back to the chart. So we have this option. We can either walk in the light or we can walk according to the flesh, walk in darkness. So when you sin and you're walking in the flesh, you're walking in darkness, how do you get back? Well, we've heard that already, but a lot of people see have trouble understanding how do you connect if 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Ephesians 5, 18. This is it. You have to compare these passages together where you have all of this description, walking in the truth, walking in the light, and over here, walking in darkness, not abiding. Uh, how do you get back and forth? John tells us in 1 John 1, 9, and the key there. The means is confession, but the key that is so important, the word that is used again and again and again from Genesis to Revelation is the word cleansing, that a person cannot come into the presence of God when he has not been cleansed from sin. And so tomorrow night we'll come back and we'll talk about that and the role of cleansing and the mechanics of cleansing throughout the dispensations. Let's bow our heads together and close in prayer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word, to be encouraged again to walk in dependence upon you, that we are to be conscious on a moment-by-moment basis that we are to live for you, to live for your glory, to be in dependence upon you, to learn your word, to know your will, that God the Holy Spirit can use that as to fill us so that he produces in us the character and the lifestyle, the quality that only you can produce. This can only be done in dependence upon you. The Christian life is impossible. It can only happen through the supernatural provision of God the Holy Spirit. We pray that you would challenge us to to seek this and to learn more about this. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.